Now, I will have to say that um, Steve, Steve Wheeler's uh, muffins were a little bit questionable. Uh, <laughs> because they were wrapped so nicely in packaging and yellow paper and had a logo of another company on them. <laughs> but they were eatable. They were edible. Edible. <laughs> Same thing. But we do appreciate all of you contributing to that. I think it went well and uh, we had a good time. Now, um, growing up um, in the churches I've been to, I've been uh, with people of all different ages and met a lot of different characters, if you know what I mean. Uh, people who are interesting in different ways. And I'll never forget one particular um, uh, older lady we met at our church years ago. Her name was Miss Alma. Miss Alma was about 95 or 96 when we met her. And she lived to be 99 and 10 months. And she was the oldest person in our church. And it turned out that Miss Alma, um, she was funny, she was um, probably about my height, half the weight, um, tiny woman. Um, she was so sharp uh, mentally. You know, I was a big Braves fan back in Atlanta, but she knew what city they were playing in and where they were going tomorrow night and what time the game was every single day. She told me what was going on in the news. And she was um, so funny and so different. She had a lot of personality. And it turned out that Miss Alma needed a ride to church on Sundays. So my parents um, decided it would be their responsibility to pick up Miss Alma every Sunday and take her to church. And so we got to know her pretty well. And she became a somewhat important part of our lives. And it was interesting because, you know, my family, we, everyone was from around here except my parents and me. We moved to Atlanta. We were the ones away from the rest of the family. And for the most part, that was okay. We still went back to um, Kansas twice a year to see grandparents and uncles and cousins. But I know that for my mom, that was hard, living a thousand miles away. For my mom, she always thought, you know, on the holidays, we should be together as family. And she always regretted that uh, me and my sister didn't really get to do that on the holidays. And so she thought it was important that we have family where we were. And so Miss Alma became sort of our substitute grandmother there in camp in Georgia. I'll never forget Miss Alma. One day, um, she brought with her a bag of peanut brittle, homemade peanut brittle. And she gave us a bag of peanut brittle, sort of thank her thank us for picking her up every Sunday. And we tasted the peanut brittle, and it was really good. I mean, it was homemade, it was really fresh, it tasted so good, we just went on and on about how good it was. Well, you know what happened? The next week, she brought us more peanut brittle. <laughs> and the week after that, and once a month for years. To the point that we were sick and tired of peanut brittle. <laughs> And it wasn't just us. Others in the church as well talked about the peanut brittle. And before long, she was bringing bags and bags of peanut brittle to everyone in the church. And she was, she was funny. She was interesting. She was sort of our family away from family. And what she taught me, as much as anything else, was that you don't have to be close to have family. And that was very important to us. As I was thinking about Mother's Day and where to go, I struggled to find the right passage. As I thought about um, family and the biblical perspective, I came to a story out of Mark chapter 3. This is Mark chapter 3. Now to give you the setting, Mark chapter 3 is obviously early in the gospel, right? It's chapter 3. Now Jesus um, has launched his ministry. He's 
He's been baptized, tempted in the desert, and then he goes out and he begins launching his ministry. And he goes out and he first he makes his power known by um, healing people and driving out demons. He challenges the Pharisees by healing on the Sabbath day. And he calls his disciples together and commissions them to go out and do the things that he's doing. And he has his disciples together. And people are starting to follow him. And he's getting quite a gathering. And people are wondering about him. He's curious. And the funny thing is, um, when he goes from where he grew up in Nazareth to where he sets up camp and, and gets his disciples ready, he goes from Nazareth um, to a town called Capernaum. Now, I was curious about this. Just how far did Jesus get away from home after he launched his ministry? When he went from Nazareth to Capernaum, how far away from home did he get? Anyone have any idea? I looked at the map, and it's like, here's, here's Nazareth, and then just a little bit further up the lake is Capernaum. I looked it up. It's 40 miles. When Jesus left home and launched his ministry, he got all of 40 miles away. Which is interesting. For a man who's now on his own, launching things and doing it differently. And so we get to this story in Mark chapter 3. And um, he's already done all these things. He's getting a following. And he goes into a house. And all of these people follow and surround the house. It becomes crowded. And there's a crowd around the house. You can't even get in to see him as he teaches and he talks. And all of a sudden, there is this sentiment among the people because of everything that he's done and everything that's going on. That somehow, this Jesus of Nazareth, this man who's just left home and launched his ministry, this man who's been driving out demons and getting a crowd to follow him, that somehow he is out of his mind and has gone crazy. And there are several people who think that. So here he is. He is um, in the house, surrounded by people. And it says in verse 21, or verse 20, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. And when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. Now, you have two people here who say that Jesus is, on one hand, out of his mind, and on the other hand, maybe wicked. And one of those groups of people is his own family. Did you get that? His own family wants to take charge of him because he is out of his mind. Now, I, my parents have thought I was out of my mind a few times in my life when I've made strange decisions. But they've never come and gotten me to take me home because I'm out of my mind. But for Jesus, apparently this is what is happening. He's gone out, he's driving out demons, he's gathering a crowd, and his family comes to take him home because he's out of his mind. Now, obviously, we know that the story is more complicated with his mother, Mary. Um, she's there at the cross. She weeps for him, all of this. But to some extent, his family seems to not quite be there right now as to who he is. What is he doing? We need to take him home. When I think about it, I said they're 40 miles away, right? Which doesn't seem very far, but I suppose if you walk it, it's what? Maybe a day, day and a half? And yes, I'm a thousand miles away from my family, but if I flew, an air, flew on an airplane flight, I could get there today. So I guess maybe it's not all that different, just different times. Forty miles away from home, his family comes, let's bring you home. And it's not just the family who thinks he's getting out of his mind. What about the Pharisees and the teachers of the law? When they look at what Jesus is doing, driving out the demons, they say, by what power is he doing that? It says there be Elzebub, another name for a demon. In other words, to say he's, he's driving out demons by demons. 
Now, on one hand, that's sort of saying you're out of your mind and crazy. On the other hand, it's saying there's a downright wicked part to what you're doing. So we've got two people saying Jesus has gone off the deep end. And one of those groups of people is his own family. That's interesting to me. So we have these people who think Jesus is out of his mind. Now, uh, let's uh, move on a little deeper. And um, we get to this part, and now Jesus has been accused of saying that um, he's driving out demons by demons. And uh, I can just see the look on Jesus' face. He's saying, what are you talking about? That's ridiculous. <laughs> um, and he gives this uh, example where he says, basically, um, why would the devil drive out the devil? Why would you say that um, I'm driving it out by Satan, and this is where the power is coming from? Um, Satan does not drive out Satan. It would divide things. Uh, can you go to the next verse? I think we've got that written down. Uh, Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, the house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. Okay. Now. Okay. So he's saying that Satan does not drive out Satan. You're ridiculous to accuse me of that. That's not where my power comes from. What are you talking about? Okay. Now, you notice that famous quote, a house divided cannot stand. Have you heard that before? Okay. A house divided cannot stand. Now, here's my question. When most people quote that, who are they quoting in their mind? Abraham Lincoln, right? Because Abraham Lincoln said that during the Civil War. He was talking about the country divided, right? North and south, the house divided cannot stand. Most people don't know he was quoting Jesus, right? That's where the quote really goes back to, in this unique uh, uh, time, this unique context in which he says it. Also, um, I hear that a lot with um, bumper stickers on the back of cars about families where one part roots for the royals and the other part roots for the cardinals. The house divided cannot stand, right? Not quite doing justice to the biblical context there. The house divided doesn't uh, stand. Jesus is not driving out Satan by Satan. Special, special and in fact, he takes great offense to this. Um, to the point that he says that they are blaspheming the Holy Spirit, as you've heard. And he calls it an eternal sin. Because they're saying that what the Holy Spirit was doing was actually um, by Satan. And he tells them that that's not okay. So here he is, he's out of his mind, driving people away. His family wants to take him home. So finally, um, the family gets there. I don't know, day, day and a half walk. They're ready to bring him home. But there's such a crowd, they can't even get to see him. And even if they could, maybe they're thinking, well, we don't want to interrupt him while he's teaching, right? I don't know. So they send word through the crowd uh, to tell Jesus that his family is there. They want to talk to him. This is where it gets funny. Um, so they send word through the crowd to Jesus. And the crowd tells Jesus that they're there. So here's the verse. Uh, then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. In other words, they're here. They'd like to talk to you. And Jesus says, Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him, his disciples that he recently called, and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Okay. His true biological family thinks he's crazy and wants to talk to him and bring him home. And he looks around the circle of his followers and says, Who is my family? These people around me. Those who do the will of God, that 
is my brother and my mother and my sister. In that moment, Jesus says that when we join the church family, we have a new family. That you have your family at home, but when you come to church and you're around other believers, you have other mothers and brothers and sisters and family. That there's a connection between us as believers in Jesus Christ that makes us a substitute family. So that whether or not you're close to your family or not, you have family here in the church. Because look around you to your left and your right. There is your mother and your brother and your sister. And it may be that your true family thinks you're nuts. And they don't know why you're here. But you've got fellow believers right alongside you. And the truth is that our world is so different and so messed up in so many ways. So the truth is that we come, all, all, many of us, from broken families, such that 40 to 50 percent of marriages end in divorce. Um, almost half of people grew up in single parent households. And even if you did have a together family, you may have had an abusive family where your mother or your father didn't treat you well or were not the most ideal parents. And there are so many different uh, places we can come from. Some of you have had children. Some of you maybe didn't have a chance because you weren't able to. Some of you may have lost children along the way. Some of you may have lost mothers along the way. Some of you may have adopted children. Some of you may never have been married. Some of you are older. Some of you are younger. And how in the world on Mother's Day do I show respect to so many different backgrounds and so many different ways of doing things where we've all got a different story when it comes to family. And it may hurt us to think about that family or mothers that didn't follow through. But here's what I believe. These are my mothers and my brothers and my sisters. When we come to church, we have a new family. And whether or not you're close, you can still have family here at the church. But there are many people who need a substitute grandmother, a, a brother, a sister, someone in the Lord to pick them up and carry them on their way. Now, this idea of the church family was um, very strong in the Bible to the point that over and over again from very early on, um, believers in Christ refer to each other as brothers and sisters. You've heard that, right? Here's Brother John. Here's Sister Mary. And that's not just uh, something we say. That is goes way back in history that we refer to each other in familial terms. In fact, you can take that all the way to Jesus. When Jesus um, addressed God, what did he call him? Father. Our Father in heaven. And sometimes he used an even more intimate phrase, Abba. Abba, Father. And that was perhaps revolutionary. In a sense, there was perhaps always the idea that God was the Father who birthed uh, everyone in the world. But for Jesus, it was personal in a real way. And so we get that phrase, the only begotten Son of God. And so Jesus referred to God in this intimate, fatherly way uh, and made it familial. And then the Bible tells us that we are the adopted sons of God, that He is our Father and Jesus is, is our brother and our Lord in a way. And so we get these familial terms, brothers and sisters and mothers, in all of these things, saying that we are a family. In all the authors refer to believers in those kind of terms. Brothers and sisters and things of that nature. And it goes more than that. In the early church, I'm not even making this up, okay? Let me tell you this story real quick. This is interesting. Um, back years ago, uh, in, in the, olden, the older days, the early church, um, it used to be that people were suspicious of Christians. Because they met together almost secretly and did things differently and no one knew much about it. And people used to criticize it. And you know what one of the criticisms of the early church was? There's an actual document of people defending the church on this issue. 
They said, well, those Christians, they're incestuous. You know why they said that? Probably because they referred to one another as brothers and sisters. And the rest of the world misunderstood. <laughs> it's amazing we've come a long way from there. But we used to be the minority, don't forget that. We've always referred to each other as brothers and sisters and family. Because we're together. And we substitute whatever we lost years ago. And it's funny in that sense. We can go to a couple more passages that talk about this idea of um, the family of the church. In 1 Timothy, you remember Timothy, we actually talked about him last week, the, the young guy who's leading the church, the, the spiritual uh, successor of Paul. And Paul is writing to him, giving him advice about how to treat the different people in the church. And it's awkward, maybe in some sense, because he's younger and this sort of thing. This is what, um, what he says in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5. I'm actually going to back up a little bit and read a little bit more. I'll start in verse 1. It says this. He's Paul's instructions to Timothy. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. So when Timothy, who's young, um, has to go about how to treat different people in the church, Paul says, if you're going to talk to an older man, respect him as if he was your father. If you're going to talk to a younger man, treat him as your brother, because it's that close. And if there's an older woman in the church, she is your mother, respect and honor her, and younger women are your sister, and do with absolute purity. Think of them as family, and treat them that way. And this is Paul's advice to Timothy, of how to get along with the different groups and different characters in church. There's another passage in Titus, chapter 2, um, just a couple of months later. And we have um, more instructions that Paul is giving to Titus about um, how things in the church ought to run. And this has some insight to it. Actually, this is where I'm going to back up and read the whole thing. Um, but what I put on the board is the instructions, particularly to women. So let me uh, read uh, chapter 2, verse 1. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men, so instruction to older men, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. So this is what you teach older men. Temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, and in love and endurance. Then he goes on to the women of the church. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderous or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. They should be respectable, the older women teaching the younger women. And he doesn't leave out the younger men either. Similarly, encourage, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. Hard for young men. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. So he goes to the different groups. And I want to highlight what he says about the women in the church. And he says that there is this relationship in which the older women can take under their wings the younger women and help them become the godly people they are supposed to be. In other words, those women become the mothers to the younger ones and guide them and teach them in the faith and take them under their wings and make their lives work out and help them out of the holes and make it work. And this is an instruction about the family of God and what we are to do for one another. 
And it's not just the women. The men do the same thing. The older men for the younger men. We teach them to be self-controlled, to do the right thing, to make good decisions, which is hard for people at times. And so there's, there's this idea that not only do we refer to each other as brothers and sisters and mothers and all of these things, we actually act that way. That as we look out and we say, I don't know how close you are to your family, but I'll be your substitute for now. And when you're going through a hard time, let me take you under my wing and help you through it. Let me be your family away from family. So you don't have to be close to have family. We are the church. We are the family of God. And you can say, I have my own family to deal with, my own life to live. I don't have time to take others in the church under my wing. You can say that. But if that really is your son or your brother or your mother, you would have time for them. In the church of God, this is your family too. So let's make time to support one another, lift one another up, take each other together as family. Let's take the time to be who we're supposed to be as the people of God. I tried very hard with Mother's Day to be sensitive of those who are mothers and are not mothers, those close to family and those who aren't, and those in different situations. And it would be hard if I focused just on one um, kind of traditional family situation. But instead, the biblical sense is to say that the real family, the real mothers, are not just the mothers that we think of biologically, but those who are mother figures in our lives. Those who have taken people under their wings and made a difference. Those who have taught them how to be um, proper and good and right in the Lord. And I've had many in my life who have been influential in that way. Brothers in church, uh, mothers, grandmothers, substitutes in every way. Indeed, I, I, I may have been a thousand miles away from home, but I always had family. And always had too much peanut oil. <laughs> but today, we're not just celebrating those who have a child. We're celebrating those who influence and bless and guide. The substitute mothers and substitute grandmothers, the people in the family of God. Who is my mother, my brother, my sister? It's those who obey the word of God. I am grateful that now that I've come back to Kansas, I'm actually closer to grandparents and cousins and uncles than I ever was for right now. And that's very nice. But I also look around here, and I have family in this room. And I appreciate those of you who have stepped up, helped me out, been kind and faithful. I am blessed because of that. And today, whether you're a mother or a mother figure, I bless you as well. Because we are the family of God. Father God, I um, thank you for who you are, for your blessings and your love and your kindness and your goodness. And God, I thank you that um, I was fortunate enough to come up in a very strong family, but not everyone did. And I just thank you so much for the people who have been an influence in my life. And I pray that we as the church will realize that we are family and step up to help one another. For that is the nature of church, to love and lift one another up, to be substitute parents and grandparents and brothers and sisters to come together and do the right thing. God, it is a blessing to be who you call us to be. So Lord, let us make the time. Let us look for those who are hurting. Let us lift them up. Let us be the family that they need. So that whether we are close or not, we have family here in the church. And that's why it's important to come. That's why it's important to be involved. Because we have the influence and love 
of our brothers and sisters in Jesus. I thank you for those who have already taken on this challenge, and I pray that more will do the same. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. This next song is our invitation song. Um, if you need to make a decision or you'd like some prayer, uh, this is a great time to come up. We'll be here to receive you. If you want to um, join the church or uh, make an extra commitment, uh, this is the time to come up and do that as well. Thank you. We stand.